uh, less than two years ago, you were earning $14 a week as a movie usher, and then $35 a week for driving a truck in Memphis. Today, you're the most controversial name in show business. Do you think you've learned anything from the criticism leveled at you? No, I haven't. On your personal appearance, did you create a sort of mass hysteria uh, amongst your audiences of teenagers? Is your shaking and quaking in the nature of an involuntary response uh, to this hysteria? Uh, would you say that again, sir? Well, what about the rumor that you once shot your mother? <laughs> you may not have heard before, several newspaper stories hinted that you smoked uh, marijuana to hit the bottle in order to work yourself into a frenzy while singing. What about that? <laughs> First of all, I plead innocent of all charges. <laughs> Three oh six Elvis Presley Drive. East Tupelo, Mississippi, was officially designated an historical site in 1978. But in 1934, the address was 306 Old Saltillo Road, and it was the home of Vernon and Gladys Presley. The couple had married on June 17, 1933. After first living with in-laws, Vernon and his father built the two-room house with $180 worth of lumber. On January 8, 1935, Gladys gave birth to identical twins who were given the names of Elvis Aaron and Jesse Garen Presley. Elvis was born first, and minutes later, Jesse was delivered stillborn. The following day, Jesse was buried in an unmarked grave at the Princeville Cemetery in Tupelo. The world that young Elvis was born into would forever shape his life. For most, the Deep South was a place of hard scrabble existence. Work days were long and hard, it was a world of segregation. Blacks and whites rarely mixed. Yet for the poorest of both groups, religion and gospel music played a dominant role in their lives. For young Elvis, the music would become a pathway to legend. By the age of two, Elvis was exposed to music at the First Assembly of God Church, located just a block from his home. The Presley family also enjoyed attending religious revivals and tent meetings. Later, Presley would remember how impressed he was at the preachers who would jump all over the stage and how the audience reacted to them. On October 5, 1945, Elvis won second prize in a talent contest at the Mississippi Alabama Fair and Dairy Show. The contest was broadcast over the radio by station WELO, and reportedly, Vernon Presley, who was driving a truck at the time, heard his son on the air and cried with joy and pride. When Elvis was 13, his mother bought him his first guitar. She had saved for months to afford the 1295. The 12-year-old Elvis sat by the family radio, learning how to play his new instrument. The music of country stars like Roy Acuff and Ernest Tubb, and black singers like B.B. King, all helped to form Elvis's musical tastes. In September of 1948, the Presley family packed up all their belongings in the family car and moved to Memphis. Elvis's first home in Memphis was in a one-room apartment at 572 Poplar Avenue. Elvis was enrolled in Humes High School. He was shy and nervous and slow to make new friends. The family struggled to make ends meet and qualified for public assistance, including an apartment in a federally funded housing project. To help out his family, young Elvis had a series of part-time jobs, including working as an usher at the Lowe's State Movie Theater. Slowly, a change was coming over Presley. He began buying flashy clothes at Lansky's on Beale Street, a favorite of country singers and local black kids. He changed his hairstyle from the popular crew cut of the time to wearing it long, slick back with sideburns. He loved movies, and it has been reported he idolized Tony Curtis. Although he enjoyed dressing like a rebel, he was also a member of ROTC in his senior year of high school. His interest in music continued, but his shyness kept him from performing in public although he did enter and win a talent contest in his senior year. 
In June of 1953, Elvis graduated high school. Later, he got a job driving a truck, similar to this one, for the Crown Electric Company, taking parts and equipment to various job sites. His take-home pay was $35 per week. In the summer of 1953, Presley decided to make a record as a present to his mother. He knew that Sun Records, a small recording studio and record label, also allowed people to make inexpensive demo records. Presley recorded two songs, My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin. In January of 1954, Elvis returned to Sun to make a demo record. This time, the studio's owner, Sam Phillips, was there and took an interest in Presley. Phillips put Presley together with local musicians Bill Black and Scotty Moore, and they began to play together. On July 5th, 1954, at Sun Records, the trio recorded That's All Right Mama and Blue Moon of Kentucky as the two sides of Presley's first professional record. At 9.30 p.m., and just one day after the record was completed, Memphis disc jockey Dewey Phillips played That's All Right Mama on his radio program. The reaction was immediate. Hundreds of phone calls came flooding into the station. Later that evening, Elvis came to the station and was interviewed by Phillips. Within the next couple of days, Sun had thousands of orders for the record. On July 12, 1954, Elvis signed a one-year management agreement with Scotty Moore. As record sales mounted and more fans got to see Elvis perform, his bookings increased and he began to appear in packaged shows with people like Hank Snow. But not everyone was impressed with his brash performing style. Elvis made his first and only appearance on the venerated Grand Old Opry radio show on October 2nd, 1954. After the show, the program's talent coordinator suggested that Elvis think about going back to truck driving. But screaming fans and zooming record sales were telling a different story. At each appearance, the crowds got larger and the press coverage more frantic. Presley's gyrations and gritty R&B sound were something completely new. In a blink of an eye, Elvis had become the hottest act in the South. On October 2nd, 1954, Elvis made his first appearance on the Louisiana Hayride radio show. He was signed as a regular and would make over 50 appearances on the program. While appearing on the program, Elvis met drummer DJ Fontana. Fontana played drums for Elvis on and off from 1956 to 1968. As 1955 began, Bob Neal, a local disc jockey and concert promoter, took over Elvis's management. Although Elvis was enjoying success, he was still very much of a regional phenomenon. In early 1955, Elvis came to the attention of Colonel Tom Parker, who was then managing country singer Eddie Arnold. Parker was actually born in Holland and immigrated illegally to the United States in 1929. After serving in the U.S. Army, he began his career by hawking carnivals and later founded the great Parker Pony Circus. In February of 1955, Parker began assisting Bob Neal in booking Elvis. In March of 1955, Elvis, along with Bill Black and Scotty Moore, flew to New York to audition for Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, a popular TV showcase for new talent. The act was turned down flat. The rejection may have had more to do with Elvis's image than his singing. At about this time, films were depicting teenagers wearing slick back hair and suggestive clothes as juvenile delinquents and troublemakers. They included The Blackboard Jungle, The Wild One, and Rebel Without a Cause. You know what kind of drunken brawls those parties turn into. It's no place for kids. A minute ago, you said you didn't care if he drinks. He said a little drink. You're tearing me apart! As for Presley, even when he would sing an innocent country song, he projected a raw sensuality that made adults very uneasy. It's interesting to note, at just about the same time Presley was turned down on the Talent Scout show, Pat Boone appeared on the program and won first place. But Elvis did make it to TV. Just a few days later, when he appeared in a regionally telecast Louisiana Hayride show, more concerts followed, and the crowds, along with the frenzy, seemed to increase with each appearance. Finally, things were also improving for the Presleys, and the family moved to a new home on Getwell Street in Memphis. In October of 1955, Presley appeared in a film documentary about Cleveland disc jockey Bill Randall, who was one of the first disc jockeys to play an Elvis record outside the South. Also performing in the film were Bill Haley, The Four Lads, and Pat Boone. The film was titled The Pied Piper of Cleveland. 
However, due to a dispute over legal ownership, the film was never released. By now, Colonel Tom Parker was taking a more active role in Elvis's career. He began negotiating with different record companies who wanted to buy out Elvis's contract with Sun Records. RCA was the high bidder, and on November 20th, 1955, purchased Elvis's contract for $25,000. In addition, Presley received a $5,000 signing bonus. RCA quickly re-released all of Elvis's previous Sun Records and then began to record new records with him. Elvis's first RCA recording session took place in Nashville in January of 1956. The songs included I Got a Woman and Heartbreak Hotel. Less than a year after he was turned down by Arthur Godfrey, Presley was on his way back to New York and his first national television appearance. The program was Stage Show, hosted by band leaders Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. It was produced by Jackie Gleason and at first was used for a summer replacement for Gleason's own show. In 1955, Gleason brought back the show as a half-hour lead-in to his own Saturday night show, The Honeymooners. The program was having ratings problems, and it may have been the show's announcer, disc jockey Bill Randall, who first suggested booking Presley. Reactions to Presley's appearance were immediate and decidedly mixed. The CBS switchboard was flooded with calls, some demanding more and others outraged at its vulgar display. Now, controversy swirled around Presley as larger crowds and screaming fans clamored to see him at every concert. Meanwhile, worried parents read lurid stories of Presley's sexual escapades. For Colonel Tom Parker, it all made for an unbeatable combination. It didn't take long for Hollywood to notice Presley. Paramount producer Hal Wallace had Elvis make various screen tests. One of the films Elvis tested for was The Rainmaker. He didn't get the role, but producer Wallace liked what he saw. The following program is being brought to you in living color on NBC. Thank you. Very, very nice introduction. On April 3, 1956, Elvis made his first appearance on the Milton Berle television show. By now, the Milton Berle show was being broadcast in color. However, most of Berle's shows only survive in black and white. Broadcast from the deck of the USS Hancock, the showbiz wise Uncle Milty was eager to jump on the Presley bandwagon. In turn, Elvis got to be seen by over 40 million people. And now, you guys and gals, all your wives and sweethearts, you're in for a real treat. This is the first time that the Hancock is going to rock and roll while still at anchor. Here's a young man who, in a few short months, has gained tremendous popularity in the music business. His records are really gone like wildfire. He's America's new singing sensation, our new RCA recording artist. Here he is, a big reception for Elvis Presley! <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and now I got a little surprise for you. Here for his very first public appearance, I'd like you to meet my twin brother, Melvin Presley. Melvin? Burl probably had no idea that Elvis had actually lost a twin brother, and Presley was anxious to please Mr. Television and never brought up the painful reality. Friends of Radio Land. <laughs> Radio Land. Radio Land, this is television. Mel Melvin? Milton or Melvin? Melvin. <laughs> I must have another brother, too. <laughs> Te television? What the heck is that? Well, it's a little box. It's yeah. got a window in it. Yeah. There's millions of people out there, and they're looking in the little window. Yeah. They can see you, but you can't see them. What a dirty peeping Toms. <laughs> But, Elvin, you're wonderful. And you keep buying them records, will you, folks? Mel, uh, who's it? You, Elvis. <laughs> Elvis. Hot dogs. <laughs> Elvis needs the money. 
Well, I'll tell you, you're mighty proud to be here on this ship here, the Yushin Coke. And I want you to know the Yushin Coke. Yushin Coke? Yushin Coke. That's what it says on the side of the boat. U-S-S-H-A-N-C-O-C-K. Yushin Coke. <laughs> well, what's the matter? I know how to spell. That's U-S-S Hancock, Melvin. <laughs> Keep buying them records. <laughs> I'm real proud of you, Elvis. Well, Melvin, I owe it all to you. You owe everything to me. You That's taught, what? You taught me everything I know. Uh, I'm glad you told that to the folks I did. I, I taught him his singing style. I used to drive grasshoppers down his pants. <laughs> That's how I keep jumping around. Uh, grasshopper. Keep buying them records. <laughs> Do that for. What are we gonna do now? Well, uh, let's sing a song. Let's sing a song to get it. Do the blue suede shoes. Half soul. Here we go. One more. Take it away. Well, it's one for the money, two for the show. Elvis's acting ability with Milton Berle must have made an impression over at Paramount because just three days later, Elvis signed a three-movie contract with Paramount with a starting salary of $100,000. Colonel Parker put his Elvis plan into high gear. He booked Presley for a four-week engagement at the New Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas beginning April 23, 1956. Billed as the atomic-powered singer, Presley was paid $12,500 per week. But the one thing that usually shrewd Tom Parker hadn't figured on was that Vegas crowds were older. Elvis's repertoire of rock and roll got a cool reception from the middle-aged crowd, and after two weeks, the engagement was canceled. During his stay in Las Vegas, Presley visited Liberace, who was playing at the Riviera. The two musical heartthrobs posed for pictures that were quickly flashed around the world. However, the Vegas setback was quickly forgotten, especially when the Presleys moved into their new home on Audubon Street. On June 5, 1956, Elvis made his second appearance on the Milton Barrel Show. Considered one of Presley's wildest television appearances, his unrestrained antics jarred many critics who called him lewd and obscene, while his fans, especially young girls, swooned with delight. How about my boy? How about him? Huh? Come on. I don't know what you're screaming about. I I want it the way they're flipping their lids, these girls down here, is I don't know, I like... Whoop, 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 whoop. I want to tell you, that beat with your foot is absolutely sensational. I want to ask you something, uh, Elvis, if I did that thing the same way you did it, do you think I could get all the girls the way you do? <laughs> well, uh, it might not have to get girls, but at your age, it'll keep your blood circulating. <laughs> Make me feel like a used car. <laughs> my, my, my tail light may be dragging, but my battery is still charging. I'll tell you that. I, uh, no, I, I, I want to. What do you do with your hair? With Tony, do you use his? Oh, Tom. No plugs, you know? <laughs> I want to tell you, how can I get these girls to scream over me this way? I really mean that. How, how can I do that? Uh, Mr. Burrow, I, I don't think you'd like it. I wouldn't like one? What do you mean? No, I mean, I don't like it. All these girls screaming, always trying to clothes off, always, you know, trying to rip you apart, always trying to kiss you. I don't like it. You don't? I don't like it. Somebody must have stomped on his head with those blue suede shoes. <laughs> you must be kidding. Are you kidding? You don't like it? No, I'm not. I, I tell you, I, I'd rather have a quiet type of girl, someone more sedate, someone that'll, that'll calm me down and relax me, you know? You don't want a girl, you want a mill town. That's what you Really, Mr. Burrell? Yeah? Uh, I'll tell you the type I dig is someone like that, a dead I can't I'm hear you. you. I'm next to you, but I can't hear you. I said, uh... <laughs> I love this guy. Somebody like Deborah Padgett. Somebody like Deborah Padgett. Oh, you like that type? No, look. Man, she's real gone. I know, know she's real gone, but look, uh, the Deborah Padgett, Elvis, she's not in your league. You know what I mean? I'll prove it to you. She's not so, too sophisticated for you. Uh, Deborah, Deborah, would you come out here, please? <laughs> De 
Deborah, Deborah, Deborah Padgett, I want you to meet Elvis Presley. <laughs> Well, I feel now, man. Cool, man. <laughs> I like that. She kissed him and he feels cool. This I don't know. Now, just wait a minute, please. Now, I, I know that Elvis is going to be here and you'll want his autographs and everything, and he's a very nice guy and I'm very glad to, but I don't want any of this rough stuff. You understand? Hey, man, do you really know Elvis Presley? Are you kidding? Do I know Elvis Presley? I remember when we were a kid and he used to sing on a farm. Was he good then? Are you kidding? He used to make the pig squeal. I know this. Oh, you've got to keep quiet. Now, stand him on. Everybody stand. You get it. Hold the autograph book. Everybody will stand him on. That's all. You just stand here. You get him. You understand? You'll get the whole thing. Now, everybody will oh. stand in line. And I went, hey, what are the Rich Brothers doing here? What are they doing? I was a hey, young man. If you want an autograph, will you stand in the back there? Well, uh-uh. I don't care who you are. Everybody wants... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Elvis Presley. You're Elvis. You kidding? I know Elvis Presley better than I know the A&P Gypsies. Are you kidding? You do? I, I know Elvis Presley, six feet tall. He's big shoulders. He's got lovely hair. And he's got blue eyes. And... Elvis Presley! <laughs> Give me the good old Rudy Valley day. Incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think that I'm revealing any secrets when I say, when I say that, uh, that Elvis Presley is the fastest rising young singer in the entertainment industry today. And as a proof of this, Elvis, I would like to present this to you. It's a special, well, it's a great award from one of the great theatrical periodicals of all times, the Billboard, in back east and all over the country. They present you this. I'd like to read it for you. <laughs> 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 Eight years with these lights. Uh, <laughs> this Triple Crown Award presented to Elvis Presley for his RCA victory recording of Heartbreak Hotel. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it. <laughs> you deserve this award, Elvis, and good luck. On June 20th, 1956, Elvis appeared on Dance Party hosted by Wink Martindale. I believe the proceeds from this show go to the Cynthia Mill Fund. Is that right, Elvis? Yes, sir. That's right. And uh, uh, I'd like to say uh, the word that, uh, uh, let's see, what would I like to say? <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that we have a, a diamond ring that we're going to uh, have as a door prize. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it's my initial ring. I've had it for some time, and it has 14 diamonds in it. And uh, we're going to give it away at the door as a door prize. I see. And uh, everything. And all the... All the proceeds from this particular show, this is July 4th at Russwood Park. Elvis is going to be there. He's going to sing and play. His band will be there. Many other stars will be there, too. And we will certainly want you to watch Bob Johnson's column in the Memphis Press Cemetery. Watch all the publicity on it and get your tickets in advance. Elvis Presley, I want to thank you again because thank we know you, you're a busy man. And thanks a lot for coming by and seeing us at the dance party and saying hello to all your friends here in Memphis and the Mid-South. Anytime you're in town and want to come by, we certainly will welcome you. I think I have on something tonight that's not quite correct for evening wear. Not quite formal? What's that, Elvis? Blue suede shoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> on July 1st, 1956, Elvis was scheduled to appear on another NBC program, originally broadcast in color, The Steve Allen Show. Elvis's previous television appearances, especially on the last Milton Berle show, had created so much controversy that Allen tried to tone down Presley by having him wear a tuxedo. After appearing on the Steve Allen Show, Presley went back to his hotel room and later, at 11.30 p.m., did a split-screen interview on the High Gardener TV show. Hi. Mm. I have Elvis Presley on the phone. Hello. Hello. Hello, Elvis. Just one moment. Hello, Elvis. Hello. Did you have fun tonight on the Steve Allen Show? Yes, sir. I really did. I really enjoyed it. First time you ever worked in uh, tux or tails? Uh, it's the first time I ever had one on, period. You mean uh, you've got, as they say, four Cadillacs but no tuxedos? No tuxedos. <laughs> I used to drive the Cadillacs in blue jeans. <laughs> That's very interesting, particularly when a cop stops you and wants to know if you own the car, huh? That's right. You have to show them all, all your ownership papers and everything. 
You know, uh, less than two years ago, you were earning $14 a week as a movie usher, and then $35 a week for driving a truck in Memphis. Today, you're the most controversial name in show business. I want to uh, uh, give you an opportunity here to go over a lot of the rumors that have been printed about you, including a few that I printed myself, because some of these things can be checked and some can't, and I think that we ought to sort of fix up the record. Now, your style of gyrating while you sing has been bitterly criticized, even by usually mild and, and gentle uh, TV critics like, like Ben Gross. Now, do you bear any animosity towards these critics? Uh, well, not really. They, those people have a job to do, and they, they do it. And do you think you've learned anything from the criticism level that you? No, I haven't. You haven't, huh? Because uh, I, don't, I don't feel that I'm doing anything wrong. Two or three columns this week that carried items that you had bought four Cadillacs. Now, what is better than that, Elvis? Mm, it's... it's <laughs> Hey, it's the truth. I, I do have, I do have four Cadillacs. What do you do with four Caddies? Well, I, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. On your, on your personal appearance, did you create a sort of mass hysteria uh, amongst your audiences of teenagers? Is your shaking and quaking in the nature of an involuntary response uh, to this hysteria? Uh, would you say that again, sir? Well, I say that when, when you shake and you quake when you sing, is that the sort of an involuntary response? to the hysteria of your audience. In involuntary? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm aware of everything I do at all times, but uh, it's just the way I feel. I mean, for, for example, if, if somebody uh, is, is uh, playing ball, they play just a little bit harder when the fans root, and I was wondering whether this had anything to do oh, with Oh, sure. Uh, uh, well, I guess any artist, uh, if the audience acts like they're enjoying it, if they act like they're with you, well, it makes you put more into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you think that your rocking and rolling has had an evil influence on teenagers? I don't think that it is. Uh, juvenile delinquency is something that's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's it just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I don't see how music would have anything to do with it at all. Uh, what about the rumor that you once shot your mother? <laughs> well, I think that one takes the cake. I mean, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's about the funniest one I've ever heard. Where'd that one come from? Have you any idea? I, I have no idea. I, I can't imagine. When you mention it to me, it's the first time I've ever heard it. Is that right? First time I've ever heard it. Well, there's another one, too, you may not have heard before. Several newspaper stories hinted that you smoked uh, marijuana to hit the bottle in order to work yourself into a frenzy while singing. What about that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Would you prefer to be uh, an actor than to be a, a singing entertainer? Uh, if I were a good actor, of course, I'm not a good singer, but... Uh, if I were a good actor, I think that I would like it a little better. Uh, although, uh, if I ever break into the acting uh, completely, I'll still continue uh, my singing. I'll still continue making records. On July 2nd, 1956, Elvis recorded Hound Dog, Don't Be Cruel, and Any Way You Want Me at RCA's New York Studios. This was the first recording session in which the Jordanaires acted as his backup singers. Presley first met the group in early 1954. At that time, Presley reportedly said, if I ever make a record, I want to use you guys singing background for me. Oh, Lord, I want to sing at the top when the saints, saints go marching go, in. Go marching in now when the saints, saints go, march, go marching in. Saints go marching now in. Now when the saints, saints go marching go, in. Go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to feel at the top when the saints go marching in. As soon as Presley was out of the recording studio, Colonel Parker had him on the road. Using the publicity generated from his recent television appearances, Presley was booked into stadiums and theaters all over the South, like this appearance scheduled for August 7th in St. Petersburg, Florida. Later in August, Elvis began filming his first feature for Paramount, Love Me Tender. By now, Elvis had bought his mother a pink Cadillac. It was only one of many luxury cars Elvis bought for himself, his family, and his lucky friends. He was especially fond of Lincolns and Cadillacs. On September 9, 1956, Elvis made the first of three appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show. Although Sullivan was very concerned about his show's family image, he couldn't help ignore Presley's celebrity status or the big ratings Elvis had given his TV rival, Steve Allen. Sullivan signed Presley for three appearances for $50,000. September 26, 1956 was declared Elvis Presley Day in Tupelo, Mississippi. Elvis returned to his hometown and gave a concert to wildly adoring fans. The shy young boy who left Tupelo was back as a national sensation, riding the record charts with four number one hits. 
Of course, fame can have its pitfalls. On October 18, 1956, Elvis stopped at a gas station in Memphis. A crowd quickly gathered. Ed Hopper, the station manager, demanded that Elvis move and hit Presley on the back of the head. A fight broke out between Hopper and Presley, and attendant Aubrey Brown also joined in. The two men brought charges against Presley, and all three appeared in a Memphis courthouse. Presley was cleared of all charges, and both men were fired from their jobs. Presley had won both the physical and the legal fights, but he did pay a price. The publicity underscored his unsavory image in many adult minds, but it also heightened the excitement for his next Ed Sullivan show appearance just 10 days after the gas station incident. Elvis Mania was in high gear on November 15, 1956 in New York for the premiere of Love Me Tender. Broadway hadn't seen anything like it since Bobby Soxers had jammed the streets waiting to see Frank Sinatra over a decade earlier. For Elvis's movie opening, 35 extra policemen and 20 extra ushers were needed to hold back the crowd, which had been forming since 8 in the morning. A giant 50-foot-tall cardboard picture of Elvis was unveiled, and the fans rushed in to see their idol on the silver screen. sensational adventure of the notorious Reno brothers, Elvis Presley as Clint Reno, who loved his brother, but also loved his brother's girl. I know you and Kathy used to be kind of fond of each other, but well, you ain't got no hard feelings against either one of us now, have you? Hard feelings? Me? Why, of course not. I hoped it'd be that way, Vance. We're so much in love. Say you ain't laid awake every night by my side thinking of him. Wishing I was Vance. Wishing you'd waited for him and never married me. Once again, the critics lashed out at Presley's performance. Their reviews blasted Elvis's acting, but they totally missed the point. Presley's fans were thrilled just to see him 20 feet tall on a movie screen. Each new Presley appearance quickly sold out, like this one at the Louisville, Kentucky Armory on November 25th, 1956. Parking lots would fill to capacity and thousands of fans would mob the theater. Most adults saw things differently. Elvis and rock and roll represented a threat to their way of life. But this rock and roll rhythm has been the seed of trouble, and we want to keep trouble out of Jersey City. Rock and roll has got to go. Some radio stations even refused to play rock and roll music. Playing rock and roll records. This week is record-breaking week here at KWK. And after this week, no more rock and roll will be played on the air. In the middle of this heated atmosphere, Presley was scheduled for his third appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show on January 6, 1957. Ed Sullivan had become more sensitive to the controversy over Elvis's swinging hips and ordered the cameraman to shoot Presley only from the waist up. The TV audience was left to guess why the girls in the audience were screaming. After the program, Sullivan called a press conference to defend his actions. His attempt to censor Presley had backfired and only helped fuel the mania that surrounded his every appearance. And those appearances got bigger and bigger, like the thousands of fans who jammed the Chicago Amphitheater in March of 1957. Presley appeared in his now legendary gold lame tuxedo, designed by nudies of Hollywood at Colonel Parker's request. The costume became immortalized when Elvis wore it on the cover of a 1959 album. In March of 1957, Elvis purchased Graceland for $102,500. By now, Colonel Parker had the Presley money machine in high gear. Elvis's concert fees kept rising. One hit record followed another, and the Colonel and RCA began marketing and licensing Elvis products. Each new item brought more and more money and fame to the growing Elvis empire. Elvis's next film, Loving You, premiered in Memphis on July 9, 1957. 
Loving You, the first big modern musical built around the fiery personality of Elvis Presley. Follow him through the barnstorming days and the one night stand, the big moment when the girls discovered him and he discovered girls. See what happens when a down-to-earth kid goes too high, too fast. It's not my future you care about, it's yours. It's what I can do for you. You don't care about me or Tex or anybody, just yourself. You've got 15 minutes to get on that stage and find out if you've even got a future. Colonel Parker kept Elvis busy. When he wasn't recording or making a movie, he was playing concert dates. Typically, thousands of fans would turn out and anxiously await Presley's arrival. In September of 1957, Elvis tried to arrive quietly in Portland, Oregon for two concerts, but a local reporter caught up with him. Elvis Presley, how are you? Hi, sir. How are you? I'm Smith, representing ABC with KCW TV. I'd like to welcome you to Portland. Thank you very and, much. Uh, what is your, your concert tonight? How long a duration will it be? The entire show will be about two and a half hours. I, I think I'm, I'm on for about 40 minutes. What songs are you going to hit? Well, I'll, I'll do practically all of my, all of my, all of my songs. Which song do you think is the biggest right now? Don't be cruel. Don't, Don't be, be cruel. How about Teddy Bear? How's it doing? It's about two million now. We have a bunch of teenagers up uh, the other side of the studio are waiting to see you. And as you can see, in spite of all the secrecy and this little devious plan, that. A lot of us leaked out. It's like yes, it always does. <laughs> <laughs> it always does. But I, I don't, I don't mind it. In fact, uh, uh, if you come into a place, there's nobody there to meet you. You start wondering, you know. On October 17, 1957, Elvis's third feature, Jailhouse Rock, premiered. As an indication of Elvis's growing muscle at the movie studio, the MGM commissary accommodated Elvis's taste in food by adding crisp bacon, mashed potatoes, and dark brown gravy to their menu during filming of Jailhouse Rock. Vince Everett, dynamically portrayed by Elvis Presley, was a tough blackboard jungle kid. Jailhouse Rock is also the love story of this rebel. How dare you think such cheap tactics would work with me? Any tactics, honey? It's just a beast in me. The fires of violence still raged in Vince as he fought his way to fame and fortune in the exciting world of popular music. And then came Hollywood. Oh, Vince, let's try it again. Vince! How do you like our movie star, Peggy? He has adapted very quickly. Well, there's not much oxygen up where he is, and the man gets lightheaded. There comes a time when you gotta take a hand in things, and that time is now. Well, don't push me, no. I'm gonna beat hell out of you. Don't try. You're talking crazy, man. You know you got it coming, son. I said don't try. A sad footnote, Judy Tyler, who co-starred with Elvis in Jailhouse Rock, got her start playing Princess Summerfall, Winter Spring, on the popular Howdy Doody television program. Jailhouse Rock was just her second film and her last. Tyler and her husband of just four months were killed in a car accident in July of 1957. In January of 1958, Elvis began production of King Creole. But a month earlier, Milton Bowers, Memphis draft board president, had hand-delivered Elvis's draft notice to Graceland. In March of 1958, RCA released Elvis's Golden Hits Volume 1, the first of a long line of hit collections. The album remained on Billboard's album charts for 50 straight weeks. Elvis's actual induction came on March 24, 1958. No soldier was ever drafted into the Army with the fanfare and publicity that surrounded Presley's. 55 photographers and cameramen converged at the Memphis draft board when Elvis, accompanied by his parents, arrived for his induction. After receiving some initial instructions and filling out forms, Elvis practiced taking his oath. That's your other right, Elvis. Next up was Presley's pre-induction physical, and the cameras couldn't wait to get some shots of America's heartthrob taking off his clothes. Then it was time to check the eyes that so many young girls were swooning over. I wonder if Elvis's blood pressure was a little high with all those cameras pointing at him. And speaking of pressure, I wonder how Elvis felt when he had to strip down and, as they say in the Army, assume the position. All with the cameras still rolling. Finally, it was time to take the oath. You repeat I and then your individual name and repeat everything after me. I, 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 I,
down this way. The bottom is there. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. That I will serve them honestly and faithfully. That I will serve them honestly and faithfully. Against all thy enemies whomsoever. Against all thy enemies whomsoever. And that I will obey the orders. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States. The President of the United States. And the orders of the officers appointed over me. The orders of the officers appointed over me. According to all regulations. According to all regulations. And the uniform code of military justice. The uniform code of military justice. Congratulations, you are now in the Army. You are all proud. That's the way you will be addressed from now on. Private Presley, you'll be in charge of the group. Private Elvis Aaron Presley, serial number US 5331076, left the Memphis draft board as tearful family and friends wished him well. Presley, along with his fellow recruits, boarded a Greyhound bus for the trip to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Arriving late that night at Fort Chaffee, even Elvis was shocked to see how many fans and reporters were there to meet him. We had a little tough time with Elvis a little while ago because our film broke on it. And we want to say, again, thank you very much for your cooperation. And we hope you're going to enjoy your stay in the United States. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Anything you'd like to say to the teenagers as a parting uh, salute here? Well, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to see him tonight, but uh, I thought it was a little late for him to be out. It was kind of a surprise when they were here. They should have been home in bed, in other words. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Elvis, thank you very much. So, that wraps up our interview from the barracks here at Fort Chaffee. As Private Presley, Elvis A., gets ready for sleep and a busy day tomorrow. Then it was time to learn the fine art of making an Army bunk. The next morning, having been gently awakened by a friendly drill sergeant at 5 a.m., Private Presley and his fellow recruits got their first taste of Army cooking. After a hearty breakfast, Presley had an appointment with a barber where he got one of the most famous haircuts in the history of the United States Army. Later, it was off to the quartermaster where Presley traded in his blue suede shoes for a more practical pair of Army boots. And Elvis could forget about custom gold suits designed by Nudie. This time it was olive drab and right off the rack. But the alterations were on the house. In less than 24 hours, the transformation was complete. Elvis Presley, teen idol, movie star, and national sensation looked like any other sad sack in Uncle Sam's army. Elvis must have taken his share of razzing from fellow recruits, especially when his film King Creole opened in July of 1958. You're a pretty fancy performer, ain't you, kid? Now you know what I do for an encore. Now he crowns his meteoric rise to fame with a fiery burst of dramatic power as hard-loving, hard-hitting Danny Fisher who sang his way up from the gutters of lusty, brawling New Orleans. There were to be many women in Danny's young life, but only two who really counted. Nellie, who knew too little about love. I've never been to a place like this before. Honey, what are you doing here with this man? How'd you get into this? How do you get out? <laughs> While Elvis was training at Fort Hood, his parents were living nearby. But in August, his mother fell ill and was hospitalized in Memphis. At 3 a.m. on August 14, 1958, Gladys Presley suffered a heart attack and died. She was 47 years old. Presley was grief-stricken and was quoted as saying, Oh God, everything I have is gone. The Army didn't give Elvis much time to grieve, and he returned to duty. On September 22, 1958, Presley and his fellow soldiers left Brooklyn aboard the USS Randall for West Germany. Elvis, what do you think about going to Germany? Uh, well, sir, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I mean, uh, uh, just before I came in the Army, we were planning a tour of Europe. And uh, I, I uh, got uh, quite a bit of mail from over there and, and everything, you know, and I'm kind of looking forward to it, really. In Germany, Presley was more popular with his fans than ever, although he continued to go about his duties like any other soldier. On November 27th, 1958, he was promoted to private first class and eventually rose to the rank of Buck Sergeant. Anticipation mounted as the time of his discharge drew near. 
Elvis arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey on March 3rd, 1960, in spite of a raging snowstorm. Elvis held a press conference. I don't know, I don't feel too old. I still move around pretty good. I was in tanks for a long time, you see. And uh, they rock and roll quite a bit. A few days later, after returning home to Graceland, Elvis held another press conference for the ever inquisitive press. Now that the Army's part of the past, can you give us in detail some of your future plans? Well, the first thing I have to do is to cut some records. And then after that, I have the television show with, uh, with Frank Sinatra. And then I have the, the picture with Mr. Wallace. And then uh, after that, I have two for 20th Century Fox. And after that, heaven knows, I don't. <laughs> I, I suppose it'll keep me busy the rest of this year, you know. After that, I don't know. As you look back on your two years in the service, what was the uh, most important thing that happened to you during your two years, whether it was overseas or here in the States? Well, there were a number of things that happened. Uh, I had quite a few interesting experiences. Slip out in the snow. <laughs> HC rations, you know, all the regular thing. But uh, I suppose the, the biggest thing of all is the fact that I, I did make it. I made it just like everybody. I mean, I tried to play it straight, you know, like everybody else. And uh, I made a lot of friends that I never would have made otherwise. And uh, all in all, it's been a pretty good experience, you know. How about uh, any romance? Did you leave any heart, shall we <clears throat> say, in uh, Germany? <laughs> <laughs> Not any special one. Uh, there was a little girl that I was I was seeing quite often over there. That uh, her father was in the Air Force, and actually they only got over there about two months before I left. I was seeing her, and she was at the train at the airport when I left. And uh, there were some pictures made of her, <laughs> but it was no big. It was no big romance. I mean, uh, the, the stories came out. The girl he left behind, and, <laughs> and all that. It, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. I mean, <laughs> I had to be careful when I answer a question. Like that. <laughs> I was in your in your service service life. Which did you find the most difficult when you? Went into basic training, or when you got over into Germany, over with the experienced soldiers, which uh, which gave you the hardest time? Well, basic training wasn't hard for me at all. Uh, it was harder afterwards, after I had gotten into a, a regular outfit. Uh, not the service itself, but just the surroundings, and I was in a strange land, and. Uh, uh, the outfit I was in, they had quite a bit of field duty. We stayed in the field six months out of the year. And it gets cold in Germany. <laughs> it snows quite a bit. And uh, uh, it was pretty hard to adjust to. There has been some rumor about uh, Nancy Sinatra and yourself. Is there a romance in the making here? <laughs> uh, no, sir, I'm afraid not. I only met her in Fort Dix. And uh, she... She gave me a, a gift from, from, from Frank, and uh, it was very brief. I think she's engaged to Tommy Sands. I don't think he would appreciate that. <laughs> the Frank Sinatra show on the ABC television network, do you have any idea of when this will be aired? I really don't know the exact date. I would imagine it's somewhere around the 1st of May. On May 12, 1960, Frank Sinatra's Welcome Home Elvis special, taped at the Fontainebleau in Miami, aired on ABC TV. He's here in person. I may pass out. Tell me all right here. <laughs> Where the heck are his sideburns? Germany. Well, I'll be a hound dog. And that's the opening, friends. and I'm glad to see the Army hasn't changed it. Wasn't it great? Well, That's the first Frank. time I ever heard a woman screaming at a male singer. <laughs> Don't you remember me there, Charlie? 
You know, I was wondering, as a matter of fact, while you were singing, Elvis, I thought to myself, I wonder what would have happened if I had recorded uh, Love Me Tender instead of you. I wouldn't have made any difference. I think it would about uh, two million records less. <laughs> he said that. You smarty pants. Elvis was back. Paramount and producer Hal Wallace were anxious to get Presley's movie career up to speed, and Elvis quickly signed on to do more films. First up would be a natural, the 1960 release, G.I. Blues. Paramount's rousing, rollicking story of America's ever-loving overseas G.I.s with a skyrocketing star who really lived it. Fire! On the way! I'm so pleased you came to Germany. I'm going to write a thank you letter to your draft board. Yes, America's most talked about, written about ex-GI is here to show the world there's been some changes made by that rugged tour of duty with the battling tankers. It's a three-day pass at those frolicking Fräuleins, but the dancing darling who blocks every pass has all the GIs in a spin. And guess who the boys are betting on to break through her defenses? It's Elvis on a love campaign no guy or gal should miss. A Lieber. For those who do not understand, Lieber translated means love. Oh, you don't have to explain that to a GI. That's one of the first words he learns when he gets over here. Oh, you too, Tulsa. G.I. Blues was quickly followed by the 1960 release, Flaming Star. You don't feel it like I do about Ma's death. I'm Indian. And I'll never forget that whites killed her because she was Indian, too. It was a time for Pacer, the half-breed, to choose. And whichever path he took, he had to hurt someone he loved. In March of 1961, Presley traveled to Hawaii to begin filming Blue Hawaii. On March 25th, 1961, he gave a benefit concert for the USS Arizona Memorial Fund in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It would be his last live performance for almost eight years. On November 22nd, 1961, Blue Hawaii opened. With Elvis as your personal guide to America's exotic Eden, our Polynesian paradise. Elvis brings you the vacation of your life in his first big musical since the songsational G.I. Blues. It worked. She's jealous. As he hits the beach with the most luscious armful of delight on the islands. Don't you like it? Oh, I love it. And I thank you for thinking of me. I was thinking of me. Do you want to kiss me again? I don't rob cradles. Did you ever see anything like this in a cradle? Hey, hey, excuse me, Mr. Garvey. Why can't we settle this? Can like I say lines? move? Chad, please. Oh, go on. Turn him loose, sis. Turn that tiger loose. Yeah. <laughs> In June of 1961, Wild in the Country was released. Although Elvis was not giving live performances during the early 60s, his car was. Presley's 1960 Cadillac, which was customized by famed car builder George Barris, was frequently sent on tour by RCA. On May 23, 1962, Follow That Dream opened. Production on the film began in the summer of 1961 in Florida. Elvis arrived on location in his specially equipped bus. The bus was nicknamed Plain Jane because the exterior gave no indication it was Elvis's bus or the luxurious interior within. 
excited for this theater. It's a new Elvis, one you've never seen before. Uproariously funny as a lawman who does everything wrong but gets the right results. Elvis, absolutely irresistible as an unwilling Lothario who turns to ice every time a lovely lady turns on the heat. Anybody ever tell you you're very handsome? Only girls. Take care of the sheriff, Pete. Turn on the music. And make it loud. I like it loud. Well, what are you waiting for? Where's your gun? Oh, I got it. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, take the flashlight. Presley was turning out movies at a breakneck clip. Barely four months after Follow That Dream opened, on August 29th, Kid Galahad hit the nation's theaters. It's a knockout. A honey of a picture full of that Elvis kind of action. That Elvis kind of lovin'. What do you do when you feel like this? People usually get married, I understand. All you had were your empty pockets and a shine on the seat of your pants. Don't push me, Willie. I'm a grease monkey that won't slide so easily. Shut up, I You said. can't yell loud enough to make me shut up. Well, I'll tell you what I think of the fight game. I think it stinks. And when it does for me what I want to do, I'm getting out. In April of 1962, Presley had flown to Hawaii to work on his next film, Girls, Girls, Girls. After a month of location shooting, Elvis flew into Honolulu before returning to Hollywood to finish the film. Uh, what are you going to do today, Elvis, after this is all over? You going to sneak out on the beach and get some sun? I'm going to take these layers off of my neck so I can walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all your buddies are... No, I, I, I was probably rest because I've been out for about two days. Have you? You've been yeah. recording lately? Yeah, I, I did a, did a uh, new album, which should be out in about another month or so. Uh, and uh, I've, been, I've been recording and uh, getting ready to come over here. And, yeah, and this picture, Girls, 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 produced by Hal Wallace, is standing right over there. Uh, how many songs have you been singing, Elvis? Do you know? I believe there's about... Uh, about 14. 14? Yeah. But uh, not about Hawaii in this one. No, I don't think it's about Hawaii. You're going to be on a tuna boat in this one. Uh, I think the songs in, uh, in this one are a uh, uh, combination of everything. Uh -huh. Rock and roll, the little clip song. It's kind of hard to concentrate this afternoon. Yeah, you're not kidding. Well, it's hard for me to concentrate any time. <laughs> Girls, Girls, Girls opened on November 21st, 1962. Elvis's drawing power at the box office was holding strong as the film grossed almost $3 million in its first few months of release. Girls, Girls, Girls. It's a storm of entertainment that brings down the house. The salty story of a two-fisted guy who wanted to own his own boat more than anything in the world, while every girl on the shore was trying to own him. And Don Juan and Casanova rolled into one. But in the boat, it's girls. Girls, girls, girls. Elvis's next film was It Happened at the World's Fair. In September of 1962, Elvis and the film crew began shooting on location at the Seattle World's Fairgrounds. This was one of the very few times Presley left the confines of a closed movie set, and it represented a unique opportunity to his fans to get close to Elvis. But it also posed some major logistical and security problems for MGM, who hired 100 special policemen to protect Elvis while he was on the fairgrounds. Six special Pinkerton plainclothes detectives were also hired and were at his side throughout the filming.
everything that has made Elvis Presley one of the greatest entertainment stars in the world. His romances. Dorothy! Get me my gun, Emma. Mom! Dad! What do you mean I... But now, something new has been added. The warm touch of a great guy. For Elvis has a new sweetheart, little Vicky Two, one of the cutest youngsters you've ever met. Of course, he has a big sweetheart, too. Several of them, in fact. One minute, there's something in this eye, and the next minute, there's something in this eye. He's got something in his eye, all right. Yes, the Space Needle rocks and the monorail rolls in an eye-popping riot of explosive hilarity. Boy, did this, this man really give you a quarter to kick him? Yes, he's some kind of nut. And of gorgeous gals. Gags and gangsters. Get moving. Come on, move! Ah! In November of 1963, Elvis's next film, Fun in Acapulco, opened. It's moments of drama at the top of the famous La Perla Cliffs and the attempt to dive into the treacherous waters below. Wanted by the shapeliest playmates in Mexico. From the younger set, who adores him, to a lady bullfighter who learned her talented passes in the corrida, and a beautiful gal in a bikini who's the shape of things to come. Oh, it must be a very important mission that sends you off in such a hurry. And if you must know, I'm on my way to La Perla to see your girl. Why don't you move me? On January 30th, 1963, Elvis purchased Franklin Roosevelt's presidential yacht, Potomac, for $55,000. He presented the boat to Danny Thomas in care of St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis. Elvis's acts of charity became legendary. Only a few were captured on film, like this check he is giving to Bud Abbott and Barbara Stanwyck for the Motion Picture Relief Fund. During Christmas time, Presley passed out over $50,000 in checks to various charitable organizations in Memphis. When it was announced that Elvis would pass out checks, Presley laughed and said, Elvis is just going to pass out, period. But most of his charitable work was done in private. 1964 saw more Elvis films, including Kissing Cousins and Viva Las Vegas. Presley's co-star in Viva Las Vegas was Sexy Ann Margaret. Rumors flew all over Hollywood that the duo were having a torrid romance. At one point, Ann Margaret actually announced to the press that she and Presley were engaged. Presley quickly put an end to the rumor, and the couple's romance cooled. Viva Elvis! Viva Ann Margaret! Viva the excitement when these two let themselves go on a wild and woolly whirl through Funtown, USA! Yes, the sky's the limit for love, laughter, and those wonderful new sounds. It's a pleasure to hear a man's opinion and not have to listen to the stubborn ravings of a boy who won't grow up and... The Elvis bandwagon of hit songs and movies seemed to be unstoppable. But by 1964, the Beatles had arrived. Dan Davis says you guys are nothing but a bunch of British Elvis Presleys. He must be blind. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> and for the first time in his career, Elvis had a serious rival for the affections of American teenagers. 1964 ended with the release of Roustabout. In January 1965, Elvis celebrated his 30th birthday. Later in 1965, Elvis's 17th film, Girl Happy, was released. In May of that year, Tickle Me was released. It was reported that Presley was earning $100,000 and 50% of the profits for each of his films. In November of 1965, Presley's 19th film, Harem Scarum, was released. On March 31st, 1966, Frankie and Johnny premiered in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. More films followed, including Paradise Hawaiian Style, Spin Out, Easy Come, Easy Go, and Double Trouble. Over the years, Elvis's name had been romantically linked to many women, especially all of his former leading ladies. In fact, Elvis reportedly said, if I slept with every woman they say I have, I would have been dead a long time ago. But all the speculation ended on May 1st, 1967, when it was announced that Elvis Presley had married Priscilla Boulieu, the young girl he first met in Germany while he was in the army. 
100 guests assembled in the lobby of the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. The double ring ceremony took place at 9.41 a.m. Following the party, a press conference was held and the world got to see the king and his new queen. On November 22, 1967, Elvis's 25th film, Clambake, was released. Principal photography on the film was delayed one week because Elvis fell in the bathroom and hit his head, suffering a minor concussion. Was it an early warning sign of trouble to come? In October of 1967, Elvis left Graceland to begin work on his next film, Stay Away Joe. He didn't want to leave Priscilla because she was pregnant. Elvis returned home for Christmas, and on February 1st, Lisa Marie Presley was born. To keep up his lavish lifestyle, Elvis had to leave Graceland to make more films like Speedway and Live a Little, Love a Little, released in October of 1968. But the most significant event of 1968 happened on December 3rd when Presley's television special, originally titled Singer Presents Elvis, sponsored by the Singer Sewing Machine Company, aired on NBC. The tremendous success of the program acted as a jumpstart to Elvis's touring and concert career. His first live appearance would be in Las Vegas, and cameras captured Elvis at the construction site of the new Las Vegas Hilton, signing a $1 million contract for a four-week engagement beginning on July 31st, 1969. There's only one reason that people really come to Las Vegas, and this is it, to play at the gaming tables of casinos large and small, whether they are downtown, where a penny can activate a slot machine, or more opulent, like this one at the Las Vegas Hilton, where thousands of dollars can change hands on the turn of a card. But hotels here also cover their bets on crowd appeal by using big-name talent in the showroom. It's no accident that theater audiences enter and leave that theater through the casino. Elvis Presley provided this hotel with sellout crowds at all his performances. The cross-section of people to whom Presley appeals can be seen in the long line of those waiting to see him perform, a line which wound through this casino and must have given hotel management mixed feelings when it removes these people even temporarily from tables and slots. 200 British fans chartered an airliner and flew here to see Presley, making this the high point of numerous stops along a Presley pilgrimage trail. They bought Presley souvenirs, like his famous hound dog, just as they must have at other stops, like his birthplace in Tupelo, Mississippi, and his current home near Memphis. But here in Las Vegas, they saw Presley perform in person. These fans may speak with English accents, but they speak with the adoration of any true Presley pilgrim. Um, means everything, a lifetime's ambition is to me it does personally, you know. Why? Um, well, I've, uh, I've always um, liked Elvis since I was 11. I'm uh, 22 now and uh, I've, never, I've never bought anybody else's records and I don't think I ever will, you know. Well, I think it's the most w uh, wonderful thing I've ever done in my life, you know. I mean, it's, I've always wanted to see Elvis in person. I know I have. What has this trip meant to you? chance to see America plus a chance to see Elvis. Which is more important? Yeah, Elvis. This is what they have come to see. In these bits from Presley's latest act, the body movements don't seem quite as suggestive as in 1956 when Ed Sullivan refused to telecast Presley below the waist. Maybe it's that Presley is now 37 years old. The style is more sophisticated just as the high pompadour and ducktail haircut have given way to the sophisticated shoulder-length styling of the 70s. Considered a superstar, Presley really doesn't need hard sell, but looking around this hotel, you'd never know it. 
And maybe that's one of the major reasons for the lasting success. Never stop selling. It's like a carnival here, and why not? That is the background of the man who created Presley, Colonel Tom Parker. Parker's philosophic presence is everywhere. No chance to sell Presley is overlooked. And if it's a captive audience lined up waiting to see a Presley performance, what's a dollar to a true fan? Special sale closeout right here. Only a dollar. Elvis souvenir book, one dollar. They're not sold in the show. Last chance here. Elvis souvenir book, one dollar. March of 1969, Charo was released. Later, 1969 closed out with The Trouble with Girls and Change of Habit, which was Elvis's 31st and last scripted movie. All future Presley films would be concert-based films. On December 21st of 1969, Presley visited President Richard Nixon at the White House. Presley, who had a fascination with guns, gave the president a commemorative Colt 45, and reportedly the president gave Elvis a narcotics bureau badge. In January of 1970, Presley returned to the International Hotel in Las Vegas for another smash one-month engagement. The following month, he was booked into the Houston Astrodome for six shows. Presley held a press conference to talk about the upcoming appearance. What do you think of Texas? <coughs> I like it. I like it. <coughs> Excuse me, I can't take this fresh air, man. I'm used to the back, the garbage can at the International Hotel, man. <laughs> if I can't smell some garbage, I don't feel at home, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> Do you have any films in the working right now or any plans? No, there's nothing in, as far as I know of, is there, Colonel? Anything in the working? I can't convince myself. An eight millimeter <laughs> Walt Disney special we're doing next year, I think. I don't know. <laughs> we're shooting it, right now, right? There's nothing as far as I know. So I, I just hope I can put on a good show, man. What happened to the Jordan Air? I can't get them out of Nashville, man. They they got stuck in Nashville, and uh, <laughs> you know they make so much money, and they they do they, they do so well in Nashville, you you can't get them out of there. You, know? <laughs> you ever put out any of those old records from the Sun label and listen to them at all? <laughs> <laughs> they sound funny, boy. <laughs> they got a lot of echo on them, man. I'll tell you. You are available to the public only in film. Yeah. For a long period of time. Well, I think the most important thing is the, uh, the, the, the inspiration that I got from a live audience. I was missing that. You see, country music was always a part of, uh, of the influence on my, on my type of music anyway. It's a combination of, of uh, country music and gospel and rhythm and blues all combined. It's what it really, really was. As a child, I was influenced by all of that. Elvis's professional career was going greater than ever. But rumors began to surface that all was not well between Elvis and Priscilla. She complained that the couple were constantly surrounded by Elvis's friends and they spent very little time alone together. On November 11th, 1970, Elvis, That's the Way It Is, opened. On January 9th, 1971, the conservative J.C.'s Club elected Presley as one of the top 10 young men of the year. Other winners that year included White House Press Secretary Ron Ziegler, a West Point professor and a biophysicist. I learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without, without a song, the road would never bend. Without a song. So I'll keep singing a song. Good night. Thank you. Elvis's tours and hit records continued. As each new concert venue was announced, it was sold out. Fans screamed as Elvis clad in one of his special karate-inspired jumpsuits prowled the stage kicking and punching in the air. In June of 1972, Presley came to New York to perform at Madison Square Garden. It was the first time Presley had ever appeared in concert in New York. Reporters gathered at the New York Hilton where Presley, joined by his father Vernon and Colonel Tom Parker, held the news conference. First of all, I plead innocent of all charges. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, dear. No, all kidding aside, we had to wait our turn to get in, into the garden, you know. No, I stopped using that greasy kid stuff, too. <laughs> just, like, just like everybody else did, man. Yeah. Well, I found that... Uh, in the audiences that we have, it's it's mixed. It's it's older people, younger people, and, and the very young, and 
all types of people, you know, which is good. I, I just made a movie of, of, of the last tour that I did. It's the first live concert that we ever found, so that's my next project that's coming out. But there's so many places that I haven't been yet. Like, I've, I've, I've never played New York. I went to Hawaii to get a tan for, for, for uh, uh, New York. <laughs> the Madison Square Garden engagement was another Presley triumph. Over 80,000 people attended the concerts. The once shy young man from Tupelo was now the undisputed king of rock and roll, with two generations of fans clamoring to see him perform and still making his records chart-topping hits. On August 18, 1972, Priscilla Presley filed for divorce. The couple had been separated since February. On September 9th, Elvis met Linda Thompson. She was the reigning Miss Tennessee and third runner-up in the Miss USA pageant. Elvis and Linda became constant companions. Later that year in November, Presley's 33rd and last film, Elvis on Tour, was released. In January of 1973, Presley arrived in Hawaii for a unique around-the-world event. Called Aloha from Hawaii, it was a live concert transmitted via satellite all over the world. Presley joined RCA record president Rocco Laganestra to announce the concert, and nearby, as he always is, just out of camera range, Colonel Tom Parker. I'm still on the I'm on stage. This is the first time that I've seen this myself. And I really should start this conference off by congratulating Elvis because we will have two new firsts. The first, first, new first, involves Elvis as the first performer to do a worldwide live concert via satellite. A real spectacular. And the second is that we will have a worldwide album via satellite. All of this has been made possible by the joint efforts of a lot of people and especially including Colonel Tom Parker. Elvis, again, my congratulations for this spectacular. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's uh, very hard to comprehend it because I, in 15 years, it's hard to comprehend that happening, you know, how, how to, do you to all, the, all the countries all over the world via satellite. It's very difficult to comprehend. A live concert, to me, is exciting because of all the electricity that's, that's generated in the crowd and on stage. But uh, it's my favorite part of, of, of the business, is a live, live concert. How do you pace yourself? Sir? How do you pace yourself? Uh, you mean physically, vocally, or...? So you are up when you need to be up? I just... Uh, uh, I exercise every day, I vocalize every day, I, I practice if I'm working uh, or not. You know. So I just try to stay in shape all the time, vocally and mentally. And Which is harder? <laughs> well, both are tough, yeah. You got to work at them, but I, I don't mind it, you know, it's worth it. Uh, well, now they shoot me all the way, see, so just the waist down. Now, uh, but I, I would like to think that I am, I had improved as an entertainer, uh, and I like to get the rapport with an audience, because it's a give and take thing. If you can, if you can, if you can do that, it works, you know, if the artist or whoever is performing can get that kind of rapport going with the audience, then it really, it, it, it pays off, it's good, you know. But do you feel that you have more of that rapport now than you did 15 years ago? I couldn't answer that, I really couldn't. I must say this about the, uh, when we first approached the various countries around the world, uh, Elvis is a, certainly the only performer that could do this today. He is well known in every country that we have taught, in fact, in every country in the world. And the acceptance was just fantastic. It wasn't a case of any selling. 
because you know he's been in demand for live performances around the world, but you just can't do this, so this is the way of approaching it. But his, the acceptance exceeded all of our expectations, Elvis. Thank you very much. That's very nice. The program was broadcast on January 14, 1973, and was seen by over half a billion people. Throughout the early 70s, Elvis continued to tour extensively, although many fans began to notice that he was gaining weight. But the crowds kept coming to see him, and many refused to leave the theater until they heard the announcement, Elvis has left the building. In 1975, Elvis broke the record for gate receipts for a single performance at a concert in Pontiac, Michigan. By 1976, Elvis's weight had ballooned to over 230 pounds. There were rumors of erratic behavior and drug abuse. He became more and more isolated from his fans as he was whisked off immediately after each performance. In 1977, Elvis had to stop a concert in Baltimore for health reasons. He left the stage and returned 30 minutes later. The tabloids began running negative articles about Presley's food cravings and reported temper tantrums. On June 26, 1977, Elvis gave what would be his last public performance at Union Square Arena in Indianapolis. On August 1st, 1977, the book Elvis, What Happened was published. Written by longtime Elvis insiders, Red and Sonny West and Dave Hebler, the shocking book describes Elvis as a brooding and violent man obsessed by death. It outlines sexual encounters and drug binges. These had to be difficult days for Elvis. He had spent so many years trying to reverse the negative images that followed him as a young performer. But now some of his closest friends had betrayed him. The only thing that would silence the critics would be a new concert tour. The first date was set for August 17th, but it was not to be. On August 16th, 1977, at 2.30 p.m., Ginger Alden, Presley's current girlfriend, found Elvis unconscious in a second-floor bathroom at Graceland. Medical assistance was summoned, and Presley was rushed to Baptist Memorial Hospital. He was pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m. A shocked nation watched as the news of his death was broadcast over every TV station. The cause of death is cardiac arrhythmia. The precise cause has not yet been determined for the cardiac arrhythmia. It may take several days to several weeks to determine that specific cause, and in some cases it never is discovered. The news came as a total surprise. Elvis was only 42 years old. Ironically, the Star newspaper was out that very week featuring an Elvis story on its front page and promoting it heavily on television. As word of Elvis's death spread like wildfire throughout the world, distraught fans converged on Memphis. At Graceland, Elvis was laid out in a huge copper coffin, wearing a white suit, navy shirt, and his diamond-encrusted TCB, taking care of business, ring. Over 10,000 grief-stricken fans were allowed to pass by the coffin. The National Enquirer managed to sneak a photo of Elvis and splashed it on their front page. On August 17, 1977, a funeral cortege of white Cadillacs slowly made its way from Graceland to Forest Hill Cemetery. At the cemetery, the coffin was pushed into place in a mausoleum located near the grave of Elvis's mother. But that would not be Elvis's last resting place. Vernon moved both Elvis's body and his mother's to Graceland to an area now known as the Meditation Garden. Almost from the moment of Elvis Presley's death, many rumors circulated about what really happened. There are some who claim he had serious health problems and suffered three previous heart attacks. Another rumor was that he was taking drugs because he was dying of bone cancer. Whether prescription or not, at the time of his death, apparently Elvis Presley was taking a lot of drugs. But whatever the reason, one thing was for sure, his fans refused to let him go. By the 1980s, rumors that Presley was actually alive spread across the nation. In 1988, the National Examiner reported a Presley sighting. Through the years, hundreds of sightings have been reported, and there have been books and audio tapes claiming that Elvis is still alive. Others claim that they have been visited by the ghost of Elvis. Both ends of his life are celebrated as fans travel to his humble birthplace in Tupelo. And thousands gather every year for an emotional candlelight vigil outside Graceland on the anniversary of his death. In his legendary career, Elvis made 33 feature films, he was awarded over 90 gold single records and over 50 gold albums, and four of his albums stayed on the charts for over a year. Elvis Presley has become a subject analyzed by authors, music critics, even historians. But in the end, the why of it really doesn't matter. What matters is that for whatever our own personal reasons, he deeply touched all of our lives.
Maybe Elvis's father, Vernon, summed it up best on Elvis's tombstone eulogy when he said, he had a God-given talent that he shared with the world. And without a doubt, he became most widely acclaimed, capturing the hearts of young and old alike. He was admired not only as an entertainer, but as a great humanitarian. He revolutionized the field of music and received its highest awards. He became a living legend in his own time, earning the respect and love of millions.